Hey, it's Mick, and welcome to my vlog of many things, where I talk about... many things. And I've been in a mood for Ruby content ever since the Justice League Ruby crossover movie trailer dropped. The movie itself... looks dumb, but fun. I'm down for this. Looks like it'll be a good time. In fact, by the time this comes out, the movie will probably already be out. Once I watch it, I'll probably make a vlog about that as well, if for no other reason than to follow up on this one. But to prepare myself, I figured it'd be a good idea to go through the Ruby series again after I fell off the bandwagon after Volume 5. Well, I didn't fall off, I deliberately jumped off, but that's another story for another time. Anyway, after rewatching Volume 2, I vaguely remembered there being a game based on the show, and... What luck, it's on the Nintendo Switch eShop, a definitive edition with all the DLC no less. It was apparently originally a fan game made by one Jordan Scott that Rooster Teeth then picked up to make as an official game. Sweet! From what I saw in the trailers of the game, it looked like this was going to be a Marvel Ultimate Alliance type game, just with Ruby characters. Again, sounds like fun, I'm down for this. And a week and $40 later, I was kind of right, but... It gets complicated. To begin with, I'm not going to give you an entire rundown of the Ruby series for this video beyond the basics for the uninitiated. Believe me, I could go on and on about what I think about the Ruby series as a whole, but I think I'll save that for when I'm finally caught up with the series. For now, I'm just going to focus on the game itself. And on that note, while the story of the game is considered canon, you don't need to watch the show to understand what's going on here, and vice versa. At least, I think. Again, I haven't watched past Volume 5 yet, so I guess I'll find out. But anyway, on with the story of this game. In the world of Remnants, the titular Team Ruby, consisting of Ruby Rose, Weiss Schnee, Blake Belladonna, and Yang Xiaolong, are an all-female team of huntresses in training at Beacon Academy, an institution dedicated to fighting evil monsters known as the Grimm. The game begins with the girls investigating a communications malfunction in the Emerald Forest as a training exercise by one of their instructors. But this investigation eventually takes a strange turn as it leads them to fighting new mutated Grimm near a secret abandoned research facility. It's up to our heroines to not only stop these new monsters, but find out who or what is creating them. There aren't cutscenes to tell this story so much as lines dropped by the characters once they reach certain checkpoints. Speaking of which, no pun intended. Everyone comes back to reprise their roles from the show. Lindsay Jones as Ruby Rose, Barbara Dunkelman as Yang, Shannon McCormick as Professor Ozpin, etc. The two exceptions are Professor Port, now voiced by Anthony Sardina, and a new character in the game voiced by video game voiceover veteran, say that ten times fast, Dave Fenoy. I won't spoil who he plays, but he does a great job in the role, as to be expected. It's nice to have the cast of the show here, but I do notice that some of the characters seem to have rushed through some of their lines, with the exception of Mr. Fenoy, which is odd. For most of the cast, at least. I make an exception for Professor Ublick, because that character's whole shtick in the show is that he talks fast because he's always hyped up on coffee. So he's got an in-character excuse. But what was the rush for everyone else? Mountain, as far as gameplay is concerned, it's worth pointing out right out of the gate that this game was clearly made with multiplayer in mind first and foremost, as the local multiplayer and single player campaigns weren't added until much later after the game's initial release on Steam. But I don't have many friends, fewer still who'd probably want to give this game a try, so I was left going solo for this adventure. Single player has you only controlling one, I repeat, one, character, as opposed to the whole team. But isn't the whole thing about Ruby the teamwork between the girls? I don't understand why you can't just have three AI take control of the rest of your team and switch between the members with the push of a button. You know, like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. I mean, the D-pad is just sitting there waiting for something to do. I know it can open up the upgrades menu, but I'm doing that with the start button anyway, so again, it's pretty much useless. But jumping back a bit, you can pick any of the members of Team Ruby to play as for your adventure. And the included DLC with the Definitive Edition adds Team Juniper to the mix, consisting of Jean d'Arc, Nora Valkyrie, Pyrrha Nikos, and Lai Ren. Every character has what you'd expect in a game like this. A button for light attacks, a button for heavy attacks, a button for jumping, but no double jump for some reason. Hmm. The usual. But 
In the world of Remnant, most of the melee weapons can transform and double as a firearm. Most of the characters have ranged attacks that you literally trigger with the right trigger button, which is a, that's a nice detail. I like that. That being said, none of this is told to you outright, as there is no tutorial of any kind. Normally, I'd consider this a bad thing, but it's not like they thrust Grim on you the second you select a level. There is a little area when you start that you can use to try and figure out what button does what. It's a sloppy introduction, but not awful. Speaking of introductions, I played the first mission a lot. Which, nice yeah, students. it was slightly annoying to hear nice the same work, dialogue students. over and over again, but I don't blame know, the game for that. That was my choice. Networking. I wanted to test out every single character to see which one I'd enjoy playing as the most to get through the story. I ended up going with Blake, the ex-terrorist ninja cat girl for my first playthrough, though Ren and Yang were very close runner-ups. Ren has a fun teleportation ability that definitely helps deal with large hordes, and Yang packs a hard wallop on anyone in her path. Funnily enough, another runner-up for me was... John. He doesn't have a gun like all the other characters, but he does have a shield bash attack straight out of Captain America's playbook, plus his semblance does double damage, which makes up for a lot. In retrospect, maybe I should have played as him, but I digress. Now, I gotta admit, running around these colorful environments, fighting random packs of grim with all these anime flips and slashes, being able to shoot them from afar, all while the heavy metal instrumentals from the show blast in the background, that is very fun. And I had a good time for the most part. But... Some of these combat encounters don't really feel balanced for a single player? Not so much in the general level itself, I'm mainly talking about the final encounters in each level. Which usually involve you fighting wave after wave of Grimm as you're either protecting an area, having to destroy a MacGuffin or two, or even trying to transport a MacGuffin from one end of the map to the other. There's also two kinds of Grimm that gave me plenty of trouble in later levels of the game. The Ursa, which are just giant bears, and a mutated Grim with a bunch of spikes on their back. These two aren't particularly hard, but these Grim are damage sponges that take forever to kill, and that really kills the momentum I was initially building up, and it sucks the fun out of the game for me. I imagine with a team of characters, these sections will be a bit more balanced, but for the solo player, it's a drag. Don't get me wrong, it's totally possible to do these solo, yes, but from my experience, A, not without a lot of patience, or B, not without dying a lot. Especially the final boss. Though, the good news is, even when you die, you keep all the experience you gained, so you can at least be better equipped for your next go-around, which is something I appreciate and does deaden the blow somewhat. Again, while I had a decent time for the most part, I can only recommend playing this in short bursts. Longer play sessions can get pretty tedious pretty fast, especially in later levels. I'd also only recommend this for fans of Ruby. From a story perspective, well, I hold video games to a different standard when it comes to storytelling. While good writing is always preferred, if the game delivers on good gameplay, then I won't mind a weak or even bad story. And while the writing for this game isn't awful, it is minimal. So, if you weren't already a fan of these characters and thus have the context of their personalities from the show, I don't think this is going to win you over or convince you to give the show a shot. I want to like this more because the concept is sound and there are elements of this game I legitimately enjoy. But I'm constantly left pondering certain design decisions. Why are the levels so linear instead of being more open to let the players really explore the land of Remnant? Why can't I control four characters instead of just one? And worst of all, why is there no double jump? I'm joking on that last one. Kind of, but you get the idea. I don't know what happened in development of this game, but clearly somebody dropped the ball here. I don't know if it was Jordan Scott, the Rooster Teeth team, the publishers, but somebody messed up here. And we're left wondering about the amazing Ruby game that could have been. And what's most ironic is that all of these problems are in an edition of the game called Definitive. DEFINITIVE! Yeah, more like definitely not finished! To quote one of my favorite YouTubers, this is one of those games that doesn't leave me wanting more, it leaves me asking, where's the rest of it? As it stands, I don't think it's worth the $40 price tag. Get it on sale if you're interested, but I wouldn't recommend buying it at full price. To wrap this all up, I've heard people comparing this to a demo or an early PS2 beat-em-up, and I can't disagree. That being said, I still had some fun, and I do like this concept. 
and I do think another attempt at this kind of game is worth trying. Just add in some elements from Marvel Ultimate Alliance, like I've been saying, and open up the environments to be more explorative, and heck, maybe even throw in some animated cutscenes while you're at it. I know you're capable of doing that, Rooster Teeth, get on it. There's possibility for a great game here. For what it is, though, it's not awful, but there's better beat-em-up games out there more worth your time and money. You can do worse, but you can also do better. And with that, I think now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Check the description or go to my channel page to find links to my social medias. And if you like what you see, give it a like and leave me a comment down below. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to stay up to date on my creative endeavors? And if you want to support me in my work, you can find a link to my Ko-fi page in the description as well. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. That'll be the day I'm waiting for. Look, I'm trying to do my best here with the Easter eggs, okay? That was, that was the best I could come up with, alright? Don't hold it against me. Bye.